Okay, so I think it's just about time, so I'll get started. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Dana Bilar, and I'm going to talk to you about, uh, well, the computer lets me. I'm going to talk to you about a common problem that we have when we want to identify and classify specific so specimens of software. Number one, on the one hand, you want to do it quickly, uh, but you, or you also want to do it exactly. So you want to have your cake and eat it too. The problem with most approaches is that they either fall squarely on one half, uh, on one end of the spectrum, and on the other one. What I propose is, is just you know, a modest approach. In German, you call it the Denkanstoß, which means you know, something to think about. Namely, using statistics, which is a form of aggregation of data, some would even say a form of compression, that is a little bit more resilient to common obfuscation techniques so that uh, we can, with reasonably accuracy and reasonable speed, uh, quickly identify and afterwards classify uh, malware. So the idea behind the three approaches I'm going to show you today is, is very handily uh, represented on the state-of-the-art graph. On the lower left-hand side, you see signature-based approaches. They're, they are quite fast, they're quite exact, but they're relatively sensitive to, uh, to permutations, they're relatively sensitive to all sorts of these obfuscation techniques that, uh, that you deal with. On the other hand, you have emulations and heuristics, which is, and I've figured this out during my training, more for black art than it, than it is a science. You have to rely on a lot of, uh, on a lot of uh, implicit knowledge. I mean, you have to know this. Uh, it's hard to codify, and it takes you potentially a very long time to go through this. So what I'd like to find is a sweet spot, like Goldilocks. You know, not too cold, not too hot, but just right. Just, just the right amount of simplifications that we have a little bit more obfuscation tolerance, and yet we, we retain some of the speed that we've had before. And the, and the vehicle with which I would like to explore this, I, I call statistical structures. No, I mean, you can call it whatever you like. I just wanted something that had some alliterative meaning to it. There are three approaches that I, I, I looked at. One was taking uh, the perspective of the opcodes. We build a frequency distribution and build from this frequency distribution a uh, fingerprint. The statistical structure there is the frequency distribution of the opcodes. We can, I did it uh, primarily through uh, static disassembly, but uh, there's no reason why you couldn't do this uh, through memory taking snapshots. The other one is uh, the time-tested and true Win32 uh, API call sequencing. So what you do is you observe uh, the, the API calls, you put them in a call vector, in a vector space model, you use a simple similarity, similarity function to uh, compare them to, uh, to other known families, and then you can classify them. Uh, very simple model, had surprisingly good results, I have to say. The third one is graph-based. Uh, if you don't know much about graphs, no worries, I'll give you the two-minute primer. The idea here is that programs can be represented through a very powerful framework, which is called uh, a system-dependence graph. It captures control flow and, uh, and call func functionalities in the graph, and we can extract certain features of this graph. And I'll talk about those features in a little while. Again, construct a statistical measure on it and try to use this for classification and identification purposes. This is the one-slide synopsis of the fingerprint analysis. In essence, again, you, you uh, tally up the opcodes of, your, of uh, the specimen that you have there, you, you build a statistical profile, and you start uh, comparing them to, you know, let's say, what I call goodware, because non-malicious software is, was too long to fit on the slide, uh, you know, good software against bad software, and see whether you can find anything, any discrepancies. Again, statistics are a nice vehicle because statistics are, are, relatively, uh, are relatively robust under permutation. If you take, just as a, a very simple example, if you take the average of 1, 2, and 5, you get the same thing as the average of 2, 1, and 5, even though the order is, uh, is permuted there. The main result I got here is that uh, rare opcodes uh, explain many, much more variation than uh, the common ones, and I'll show you this in a second. A, little, a word about the procedure. I fired up my old Osborne 1, and I inventoried all the PEs, and there I, I ran them through, I took a random sample, I ran them through IDA, through IDA with, a, with a customized uh, instruction, instruction counter plugin, which also recorded some meta information. The important stuff on the slide is uh, right around here. Gave me out the compiler. I wanted a few more factors. This I put in by hand, uh, you know, what kind of type of software it was. This is just my own taxonomy. The, the meat of the instruction counter is here. Gives you a ranking. The number of, of the opcodes, 20% were mobs in this particular program, and there were 2,000 of them found, push calls, and so on. I parsed this, and then I fed it into, into uh, into Excel and uh, did some statistical analysis on there. For the malware, I took a few more precautions because I listened to uh, Jason Geffen and Scott Lambert who told me always do this in a virtualization environment. So I did this in, in VM player. I again ran it. The only difference I did here as opposed to the goodware 
what I call non-malicious software, is that I fix seven classes. I wanted to also see whether there are signatures that differ across classes. So rootkits, uh, trojans, backdoors, tools, bots. Uh, I, I just, I just uh, assigned, assigned the malware to these seven classes. Again, I did, I did the same procedure, and, uh, and I, I, I put the data into Excel. If we look at one of the first results, you know just this, this old pie chart. Normally I hate pie charts because of their waste of ink, but this here shows you something uh, interesting. So we're about 400 opcodes or so. We found about half of them. Uh, so about 72 opcodes cover practically everything. You know, two thirds of of, uh, of all of, of of all counts are covered in the first five opcodes, and the 14 opcodes cover over 90 percent. And as you would expect, you know, mov is in there, and push, and call, and pop, and so on. This is for uh, the good software. For the malware, and this was aggregated, and this was uh, 67 Ps, this uh, again class box on my 250 ones, uh, we have a similar picture. We have in the, the top five opcodes cover about two thirds, where the top 14 over 90% and the top 60, uh, 100%. Uh, I found two undocumented ones, which was, which then in hindsight showed me, aha, uh -huh, you know, rare opcodes do carry some information, but more of that uh, later on. This slide, uh, uh, how do you parse this? See on the on the outer rim, this is the aggregate malware, and on the inner rims, these are the class block ones. I don't know if you can see this from the background, but I anticipated this, and I have a zoom tool. So, so the the second most outer ring is the worms, the third most is the virus, the fourth is the trojans, bots, tools, uh, uh, then rootkits, uh, user rootkit kernel. Okay. Now, from this slide, you should only take that. You see there are some discrepancies in the, in the very common ones, but as we go down here, you know, they seem to, uh, the, they seem to, the distribution of uh, frequencies and occurrence seem to kind of converge here. Now, if I tally this up, this is completely in unintelligible, but I just wanted to see what, uh, what you get here. These are some kind of breakdowns. How do you read this? These are the top 14 opcodes, the top, more, the 14 most frequent opcodes. This is my baseline, goodware, right, uh, for the non-malicious stuff, and this is for the other classes. And we can see here, you know, they are, uh, the viruses used uh, on, a, on average, 16% were mobs, 22% were pushed, and so on, as opposed to the goodware, 20% push, 8% were calls, and so on. The key here was that this is a frequency distribution. Now I'd like to see whether I can run some tests on this and answer, and answer a, a, a simple question, namely, given that I have this opcode frequency distribution, is there any significant difference for malware in this, in this kind of distribution? So I'm looking at the distribution of the goodware and the malware, trying to figure out, is there something other than chance that could, that could explain, uh, that could explain uh, discrepancies or similarities? So on the left there, you see my, you see my uh, baseline. What I did was, uh, for the statisticians among you, I did a, a contingency table test, chi-square testing with uh, a Huber and Star residual test. What I got here, uh, that's such a little thing magic. How do you parse this? Well, it's a little bit hard to parse, and most of the explanation will come in the next slide. What you can see here, what you should get from the slide, is just I color coded it for, for visual convenience. Whatever is darker means uh, higher, uh, means higher or, low, or, or lower, uh, higher or lower discrepancies. Whatever is white seems to be kind of similar. Whatever is, is is darker red or darker blue seems to be different. So we can see here that uh, the kernel rootkit, for instance, has. Practically everything, everything seems to be significantly different from the, from the normal stuff. Tools seems to be kind of, you know, roughly, you know, two thirds and so on. Worms, for some odd reason, like that too. I don't know why. If we, so what I what I saw, what I showed you on the previous slide was there is, a, according to the tests, and again, it's a statistical test. This is not, you know, the word of God coming through Moses. All this thing tells you is that from this from this test, this is what uh, it tells you it's significant. There's another. There's another statistical test you can run, it's called Kramer's V. What Kramer's V, and this is the, the top line here, tries to say is, listen, okay, you figured out that there is, a, you figured out that there is a, an association between the column and the row variables, between the classes of software and the frequency distribution, but how, how much of the variation of the data does it explain? And what we find here from this, uh, from this slide is that uh, just five to 15% of, uh, of the variation is, is explained actually through this, uh, through this association. So this is not a very good predictor. So what you get from the slide is the top 14 opcodes, the most common opcodes are not a good predictor to be able to say this piece of uh, software belongs to goodware or to any of the malware specimens. I have here a few, I have here a few uh, 
hypothesis why I've seen uh, why I see this discrepancies that I uh, that I see in the in the testing. Uh, people with much more knowledge than I do can probably figure out much better reasons why this is, but these are just my uh, thinking my thinking on it. Sampling the horse from the other end. Let me look at the rarest opcodes. This is a sampling of the rare opcodes. They're so rare that I couldn't get them anymore in percentages. I have to get them in parts per million. So these are samples. You know, so this is uh, out of uh, one million opcodes, 37 will be F div P, and 260 will be knobs here, and, and, and 20. This is all for my samples. Again, I, I ran this. I did again the chi square test with the star residuals. And uh, what I found here is, again, the, the, the more interesting. The most interesting part here is, uh, again, Kramer's V tells me that although I don't see uh, in many categories a statistical significant deviation, and those that I do see, it does explain you know, anywhere between 12 and 63 percent of the variation, depending on where I am. This may be an artifact of, uh, of selection sampling bias, or, or this may be a real effect. I'll have to investigate it further. But it conforms a bit to intuition that you know, they try to be a bit evasive, you know, have some instruction substitution, all these little obfuscation tricks that, uh, that you learn from, uh, from ATAM's book or that you learn from Zor's book on, on, on my research, you may find this in there. Okay. So what I would like you to get from this in this first third is the rare opcodes carry more information, uh, seem to carry more information that can be used for classification and identification purposes. There are, of course, further directions. I added a, a few more categorical data when, when I did the inventorying with, with IDA. I can still study. Uh, I studied this in the two-way contingency table. One, one way was class, and the other one was opcodes. I could have a third or a fourth dimension for compilers. Compilers may produce a pattern that uh, you should investigate, you know, the three or four or five common compilers. Uh, you can start expanding, you know, common opcode nuggets. So there will be a size between, between basic blocks and isolated opcodes. And, of course, try to attack the scheme you know, specifically uh, with the purpose of defeating it, which I haven't done yet. Now, if you want to do some related work, uh, I, I, uh, advi I can recommend uh, these three papers and so on, and a few more references at the end. Now, for this is more for identification. Let's see if we can find classification. This is work that I did with my honor student, Chris Reeves, who's now Vigilant Minds, uh, a couple of, a year ago or so. So the key, the key, uh, the key procedure here is we run the stuff, we record the API calls, we construct a fingerprint from, from the API calls, not an ordered sequence, just the mere fact how many times are they called, put them in a database, and then cross-compare it using a similarity measure. The, the interesting thing was that this relatively simple model, I thought to myself, Chris, we'll start like this, and then if it doesn't work, we'll go to finite state automaton, yielded surprisingly good results. I mean, 80% for a first stab, where you don't have to do very much, you know, it's, it's not bad. I mean, at least for me, it's not bad. <laughs> if, I'm 80, if the weather forecast was 80%, right, I'd be very happy. High-level overview of how we did this. Data collectors, you know, we build a vector from the, from the API calls. We, we dump them to the database. We used, uh, com uh, we used a comparison, and uh, we then assigned it to a family. Again, the goal here was classification of malware that we knew was malware, but we didn't know which family it belonged to. We wanted to see whether we could, we could classify them just, for, just uh, with the API calls. Uh, how does the data, data collection work? We set up, again, a fake environment. We faked the network. Uh, there was a DNS server and so on, so they thought they were in there. The, rel the relayer, we logged it to file and to the console so we could, we could have a look at it. What did we do? We used inspiration from the Microsoft Ethers project. Uh, we, hooked the, we hooked the functions. Uh, we injected into the, in the, into the process address space. We hooked the functions and just recorded. Uh, I invite you to look at the Microsoft Ethers project for, uh, for more details on this. What is the actual data we recorded? This is, a, this is a, a, um, an illustration. So it's a vector. Think of a vector, 1,200 elements, and each element uh, s tells you the number of calls of a, of a particular call. So find close was called 62 times, find, file first, find first file A 12 times, and so on. We did this for about, we collected about, the vector was 1,200 plus dimensions, 1,200 uh, plus dimensions. So each malware specimen had one of those. What we did then is we computed a similarity measure. What is this? this is, there are many similarity measures. This is probably uh, one of the most common ones. If you remember from high school geometry uh, what a cosine is, yeah, it's, very easy to, it's very easy to understand. If you have two vectors like this and they're perpendicular, if you project one onto the other, you'll, you can't really. I mean, because the similarity will be zero. The more, con the more similar they are, the more they'll project, one will project onto the other, and the higher the score will be. Similarity measure uh, normalized between zero and one. So we, uh, we fudged around a bit with the threshold and we assigned. We assign things to a family if uh, the similarity measure exceeded a certain threshold. 
these are our results. We, we collected 75, 77 malware samples, we ran them against 17 AV scanners, and then we did, uh, we looked at their classification, and then we looked at our cl classification with our scheme. And with about the threshold of 0 0.8, I mean, the, the similarity was about 0 0.8 when it came to this very simple, unordered, uh, just number of occurrence uh, API calls, it was about 80%. So uh, our sweet spot was, was about here. Uh, you can see where the discrepancies were for these, uh, for Beagle and for Enor, MyDoom and so on. We had a few false families, we had a few missed families. You know, as, as you increase the threshold, uh, the, the missed family, the missed, the, mix, the missed families, of course, increase because you require more stringent proof. So again, it's a, it's a fuzzy factor. Statistics is a fuzzy business, right? The good thing is it makes you more tolerant towards uh, slight pertur perturbations. An interesting side effect, even though uh, intuitively, this should be so, but like Oscar Wilde once said, sometimes it's the duty of the intelligent person to state the obvious. It's pretty impervious towards uh, packers. We probably don't use much API calls and so on. We could, we could uh, classify it pretty well. Or, uh, or it, uh, well, in essence, it was impervious, and maybe we'll look at this a little bit more. So this is the summary. This simple sequence of API calls was robust towards packers, 80% accuracy, uh, without even putting it into, uh, into anything more complicated than this very simple database where we cross-compared with this mathematical cosine similarity model. What can you do? Well, you can never be too rich or too thin, and you can never have too many, uh, enough samples, so we should get more malware samples to investigate this a bit more. Again, uh, technique-specific exploits to attack this kind of classification scheme can be run. What we can also do is uh, build a, a bit more intelligence into the actual modeling of the sequence called using, uh, using a finite state automaton and, and this I learned uh, from uh, Zanero's talk, which was about an hour before. This is how I can hot patch. The, I invite you to have a look at his classification scheme, which, which went actually according to a system called argument, something I hadn't seen done before, so I'm very grateful that I went to that talk. If you uh, want to uh, see related work, you can look at Sekar's work. He actually built a finite state automaton. Strange enough, he stopped. He didn't, I mean, it was a very good approach, and then he didn't need to stop. I didn't, he didn't really run it on, on too many things. Rabek built kind of a whitelist and so on, and Rosanoff, that's a master's thesis at the Polytechnic in New York, uh, did, uh, did this, but statically. So he went to the code, statically disassembled, figured out the API calls, and did a very neat uh, finite state automaton uh, result on this. Um, the final thing, the final approach, again, so we had fingerprinting on opcodes, we had fingerprinting on API calls, is on graph models. The, the key idea is here. Represent the program as a graph, figure out some metrics of this graph, and again, construct a fingerprint that can be used uh, in a statistical manner. In order to do this, one has to know a little bit about, uh, about you know, representing programs as graphs. And here's the whirlwind tour. You all heard, and you all probably did it, a function called an IDA, you know, we can have the control flow graph. So what we first have is a, pro is a program dependence graph, which includes the data dependencies and the control flow dependencies. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an augmented, it's an augmented, if you will, control flow graph. This, this, this uh, neat little graph from Code Surfer can serve as illustrative purpose. The green arrows they tell you the data dependencies, and the, the blue arrows tell you the control dependencies. So, uh, just to, so sum, sum equals sum plus i is dependent on i here, and i equals i plus one is also dependent on i because it updates itself. So the green arrows are the data dependencies, the blue arrows are the control dependencies. The T stands for we take the branch of truth. This independence graph you can view if you want the one-liner for this as an aggregate, the, uh, an aggregate uh, PDG augmented with call functions. So now we have, this we have everything. We have control, we have data, and we have calls. Calls between, uh, between these, uh, these, uh, these procedures. Again, from CodeSurfer, and I invite you to, I'll, see, I'll have it in the reference, to go and look at their tutorial, 30 pages, and that's all you need to know for the beginning. It's like the 80-20 rule to get in there. So here we have, again, the same, the same graph. We have, uh, we have our main program, our PDG, PDG here, and we have it augmented here with, uh, we have it augmented here with the calls uh, to add, as, as you can read it here in the code. The main point to get from this is that these programs can be represented as graphs. The, the statements here are nodes, and the control and data, and control and data, and call dependencies are the edges. The, the thought here is this. Given that this is a graph, and given that there's a rich theoretical uh, literature on analyzing such graphs, and I invite you to look in the reference, read Mark Newman's paper, 2003, 67 pages, and she'll be up to speed, uh, is that we can, we can find some features of these graphs and, uh, again, construct some statistics and then figure, it out, uh, and figure out whether we can use this for classification purposes. 
again, this is the most intuitive of the ideas so far. I haven't actually done this yet because I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, assembled all the tools I needed, but I'm giving you some food for thought. I'm heartened to see that this graph-based approach is not, I'm not the only one who, uh, who's thinking along those lines. Flake did this last year. He did it this year again in the challenge for RE tools. Then I went to the very nice talk of those UCF students, uh, Sidewinder, who actually used this for reachability analysis. You know, you have a vulnerability down there, you have some sort of entry point, how on earth are you gonna get it, and they use a genetic algorithm. Very nice talk, uh, I invite you to have a look at it. A prime on graph, what do you have to know about graphs? In essence, two things, well, three maybe. The nodes, the edges, and the edges and nodes can have, actually four things. <laughs> the nodes can have weights, the edges can have direction. Well, so direction means it has an arrow. This framework is so powerful that very many phenomena in real life can be modeled as graphs. I, I took here a random sample. You've heard all of the Kevin Bacon game. Kevin Bacon game is nothing but uh, a graph, a graph, a little graph exercise that you can give to undergraduates. You have also a thesaurus. You, ha you have uh, telephone networks, internet networks. If you ever seen that huge graph, you know it's, it's in essence uh, a network graph. Uh, to, my, to my surprise, chemistry networks can be done with this. Food networks, but it's a prey, sexual networks, dating networks, whatever you want. The graph paradigm is so simple and so powerful, it can be applied to all these different places. I'll give you a couple of, 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 of examples of what I mean by measures that you can put on graphs. One is centrality. Centrality means importance. If you take something home, centrality just means importance. Now, I'll give you three centralities, there are more. One is degree, and we see here. This is a star graph, and uh, just here for illustrative purposes. The degree centrality says how many nodes are connected to me. So, you know, I count the immediate neighbors. So here we see, you know, uh, everybody has a normalized, you know, 0.25, except for the one here on the outer edge has 0.17 because they only have like two neighbors and everybody else has, has three. Now, closeness. Closeness you can add, is how close am I from all other nodes? In the star graph, of course, the closest one is the one in the middle, right? It has the highest value because you, it's easiest to get to every node in there. And the ones with the lowest value in the star graph are the ones on the outer edges. And here, this one here I guess is a bit increased and this one here too because the closer you get to the middle, the closer you are to all other nodes. Between the centrality, that's a, that's a very nice metric because it conforms intuitively to our notion of importance. Not just how many friends you have, but how important are you to everybody else around you. If you are the go-to guy in your organization, you, you have a high in between the centrality. It means how important am I to any two nodes. Again, the one in the middle is the most important in this star graph. Not in a graph in general, but in this star graph. Why? All these, if, this one got, if this guy is gone, none of these subgraphs can get to one another. We see the ones on the, on the, outer, on the outer edges are zero. Why is that? Well, because they're not important for any communication. Any two nodes can communicate without going to the ones there. So the between the the importance is zero when it comes to how many paths lead through me. Okay. Now, another measure is motifs. Motifs are, are subgraphs that are that are connected that recur more than uh, more than it would be normal just by chance. So it's a it's a, in essence pattern in a graph. Uh, we have here. Uh, we have here a sample of a primitive sample graph, and we have a, 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 a little motif example. Why motifs are important? Motifs are important because they can give you clues. They're like, uh, you know, like, fossil, uh, like fossils for, uh, for archaeology. If you model processes with, uh, with graphs and you find motifs that recur again and again, you can, uh, well, those were two tautologies in one. <laughs> you find motifs, they tell you something about the, the dynamics that drive the network. They tell you something, most likely, about the generative processes. And they tell you something about if the, if the, if the, if the phenomena that you're modeling is, is top-down engineered, they tell you something about design principles in them. I'll give you an example. This is uh, a feed-forward loop. This feed-forward loop, very simple. Uh, you find it in electrical circuits for those of you who are EEs. X influences Y, Y influences Z, and X also influences Z. You find this in all sorts of biology, uh, in chemistry, you find this in ecology, engineering, and who knows, we may find this also in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our research. If you're interested in this, I have a, I'll show you a few references uh, at the end that you can read up on. It's a very hot topic, finding motifs and so on. Okay, so what I was saying is this. Represent programs as graphs and find these measures on them and do analysis. Why, am I, why do I think this is fruitful? I think this is fruitful because in every other area that I've looked at, and if they've done this like in two dozen or 20 different areas, but we haven't done it really uh, in a systematic way uh, when, it came, when it comes to uh, our area. So I think we, w there are some fruitful results that wait there. Uh, related work to this graph-based graph fingerprinting. Uh, look at Flake's pr Black Hat presentation in 2005. Uh, Mihai is here. Uh, he'll be happy to answer any paper on the, uh, any questions on this here. If you're really, if, if, if you're really, uh, you know, a code, a code monkey and very code inclined, read the stuff about interprocedural inter static slicing. It will give you new perspectives on program dependencies. Flake's uh, talk here for new challenges is nice. 
And so, again, as I said, this UCF student who, who did a sidewinder is also a nice approach because they use a graph-based approach to find this. Okay, um, if you are interested in what, I, what I've been saying, and I, I realized it was a whirlwind tour, if you want to know more about statistical testing when it comes to this categorical stuff, I refer you to Huberman and, and Everett. You can get this through interlibrary loan or Google for some papers, or go to Fravia's uh, lecture on how to get any book for free on the web. For network graph measures, uh, if you're interested in motifs, go to Alon's work, that's very nice. Uh, Mark Newman is a nice survey paper, and Imadis as I am, you can go to my course on the science of networks if you want. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a senior level uh, undergraduate course on, on uh, network and network analysis. System dependence graph, again, if you need the one hour introduction, go to the grammar uh, website and read the KISS, read the, read the KISS uh, paper. I've come to the end, uh, and I'm also, I mean, my, my powers that be have sent me here so I can find people who would like to collaborate with me so I can stick uh, students on certain projects like that, talented undergraduate students. So if you'd like to, if you have something that you think is pedagogically useful along these lines or even other lines, I'm open, uh, uh, we can do this. And like with the airlines, I know you have a choice in talks, so I thank you for coming to mine, and I'll be open to any questions.